Thanks for joining us here at um, Coral Expeditions. Um, my name's Ramona, I'm the sales executive for Coral Expeditions. Um, I've been with the company for a couple of years now. Um, very passionate about the company, it is an amazing company. Um, as you will learn from these two gentlemen who you're gonna see um, shortly, our expedition team that's gonna be joining us. Um, we have a very relaxed lifestyle um, here on board. So we have been operating for about 35 years. Um, we are celebrating the 35th year this year. And um, our main purpose is generally to take those groups of like-minded explorers to remote parts of the region um, with expert guidance at warm Australian hospitality. Um, being an Australian flagged vessel as well, um, the beauty of that too is that actually allows us um, a number of things, but one of the main things is um, we're not required to go into international waters at any time. So that means we spend more time exploring our beautiful Australian coastline at the moment. Um, and less time having to actually spend time um, steaming out to shore, uh, out to international uh, regions. So um, nice little bonus there, especially for the likes of the Kimberley and places like that where there is so much to explore. Um, but today we are actually going to take you on a bit of a journey through Australia's remote north um, on one of our Torres Strait expeditions. So um, our coastal cultures of the Torres Strait and Cape York um, that is a, a new introductory itinerary that we've actually just released. So um, it's looking to be an annual itinerary. Um, we've, at the moment, we've got two departures scheduled, um, but do keep a, a tab on our website um, for any changes with those potential dates as well. Um, but it is a fantastic itinerary and you're going to learn all about that from our two fantastic expedition leaders um, who I'll introduce you now. So we have uh, Jamie Anderson and uh, Ian Morris. So over to you, Jamie. And um... Hi, everyone. Uh, I've been with the company now 19 years and uh, I've been travelling up and down the uh, East Coast up to uh, Torres Strait for a long time. Spent a lot of time in uh, uh, Cape York, right up on the tip uh, when it was called Cape York Wilderness Lodge. And uh, uh, there's nothing more spectacular than the country of... Uh, uh, the Cape York Peninsula. And then Ian, feel free to um, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about you. <laughs> yes, hi folks. Um, Ian Morris, I live in uh, the Northern Territory, uh, based these days in Darwin, although a good part of my life I was in the Arnhem region and I also worked on uh, Cape York on some of our little known marsupials and things like that. And uh, so I've spent my whole working life up in the North. I've been with Coral Expeditions about the same length of time as Jamie. And uh, both of us really enjoy uh, showing other people uh, what a fantastic place the North is. There's just so much to see. Every trip's different. Jamie and I are constantly learning new things as we wander around with our guests too. So it's, it's a very exciting place all up. One of the areas that we go and visit uh, is Cooktown. Now it's not very far uh, to Cooktown from uh, from Cairns, but uh, there's a great deal uh, of uh, history associated with Cooktown. Um, it started off with the indigenous people, of course, arriving in this area uh, many uh, uh, tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, it is the gateway really to places such as Laura, uh, where you have uh, the Quinkan uh, uh, country, Quinkan art, absolutely beautiful art. It's also, of course, uh, the area where uh, James Cook came and uh, uh, repaired the Endeavour uh, in the Endeavour River. And uh, of course, there's the Palmer Gold Fields as well. So Cooktown really is a historic uh, township. It's, uh, it's got a little bit of something for everybody, Cooktown. It's, uh, it's based at the mouth of the Endeavour River, um, which Captain Cook uh, named, and uh, his little sojourn there while he fixed his boat up. It's also got a lot of interesting wildlife. The first uh, uh, kangaroo ever uh, collected by scientists, if you like, was, uh, was collected on Captain Cook's voyage uh, in 1770 at Cooktown on the slopey uh, grassy hills. And uh, that's now in the British Museum. Part of that specimen was bombed in the, in the Second World War. So now there's a second one from Cooktown there. So there's all this amazing kind of history. The Aboriginal history is phenomenal. And uh, it goes right up to Cape York. So we, we look at that all the way up and it varies as the languages and as the countryside itself varies, so the people vary. So there's a lot of variation in the culture as, as we travel up Cape York. And, uh, and then there's the beautiful rainforest and so on, it just goes on. 
it's also a great place uh, for uh, botanical history as well. And this is where Joseph Banks and also uh, Salander uh, spent a lot of time finding new species of plants. And uh, there's uh, the gardens, the Salander gardens that uh, are quite spectacular in Cooktown, well worth a visit uh, while we're there. We do spend a fair bit of time offshore, don't we? It's, uh, this, is, this is one of the, uh, the special features of, of being ocean-based is uh, we get to jump into the water at regular points. And of course, the barrier reef is pretty amazing. Um, and we do know where some of the better spots are for, for our guests to, to go and snorkel and see all these amazing things like those giant clams and all kinds of coloured reef organisms. So that's a regular feature of our, our trip up north towards the tip of Cape York. It's also got some spectacular uh, views that you can get, especially from walking up the top of uh, Cook's Look. This is uh, where James Cook actually walked up a couple of times in uh, one morning to see if he could spot an, an opening uh, through the reef to get out of the inner side of the reef. And after a couple of visits up the top, finally found it. Uh, at the same time, you get these absolutely incredible views of Watson's Bay and also uh, of Blue Lagoon. And uh, uh, the walk is, is strenuous, but uh, it's the, the botanical and also the, uh, uh, the, the uh, creatures that you find along the walk are very, very special. So there you can see some of those uh, creatures that Jamie's talking about. Uh, it's a paradise for turtles. And uh, I, we see about four species of turtles. That's the green turtle there. They're probably the most common of the, the, the turtles. And it's, they're also the most friendly. So you can actually snorkel up beside some of these turtles in the water. And they're quite happy to, uh, to let you take their photos and whatever else. Um, and it's a great place for people who are a little bit nervous about going into the ocean. Um, very friendly sort of a place. Um, the, the crab you can see down the bottom there is a ghost crab. Um, they play a pretty important role in, uh, especially at night time on our beaches, um, in uh, keeping numbers of the other organisms down. They also eat little turtles if they can get them, but um, they're, they're a major beach predator. Um, and we do get to see uh, things of an evening. You can see there's a beach barbecue going on. People are enjoying a setting sun on a, on a pristine ocean. Um, and, uh, and that's when we see the little ghost crabs pop out of their holes. And uh, usually that that's comes at the end of a beautiful day of, of snorkeling around or diving if necessary. There's some of the guys with their tanks on going to have a look down a bit deeper. So there's sort of something for everybody uh, in that Lizard Island area. One of the uh, best stops uh, I, I believe on, on any of our journeys up along the East Coast is uh, Stanley Island. Uh, it's within the Flinders group of islands. And uh, we're always very lucky to have uh, uh, Danny or one of his, uh, um, one of his boys. And uh, um, they take us on a, a guided tour of this magnificent art site. And it's an occupational art site or an occupation site. Uh, there's also, again, a great deal of, uh, uh, of bush medicines and bush tucker, which Danny and his, uh, his people can uh, uh, tell you all about. So it becomes a really uh, extremely good guided tour and uh, uh, it's very, very uh, um, informative. Danny comes from just behind Cooktown um, at Hope Vale and uh, he's a part of a network of traditional owners uh, that cover the Cape. So Danny, Danny accompanies us uh, right up to the top usually and he really is an authority on a lot of the uh, natural and uh, traditional uh, uses of, of the area and uh, he's a very entertaining man so it's great to have somebody who's connected with the land like that actually accompany us when we can get him. We, we also utilize other areas within the Flinders group uh, including Flinders Island uh, and also uh, go across Bathurst Bay to Cape Melville and I suppose one of the most uh, uh, one of the most interesting uh, pieces of rock that you can find is, is actually down in the uh, uh, right-hand corner there with uh, 1899. And this belongs to the uh, HMS Dart, which uh, was um, uh, moving through these waters uh, and uh, uh, was doing uh, 
navigational exercises and also uh, mapping uh, the uh, shorelines there. And uh, you can see the amount of, uh, of wear and tear on that, uh, that rock since 1899. That's amazing how the place never stops changing and it's still doing that. Now we're looking out onto some of the outer uh, sandbars, reefs, um, the ribbon reefs and places like that. And there we get a chance to drop into various spots and check on seabirds uh, and other marine organisms. There's a uh, nautilus shell there quietly eroding away on the beach. And we get a chance to see what the outer reef's all about. And uh, again, it's a very benign place uh, where you can snorkel around and look at things or you can sit down next to nesting seabirds who are quite happy to have you there. Um, so it gives you a whole different viewpoint of what the Great Barrier Reef's all about. Restoration Island uh, is uh, a, a stop that we've uh, uh, go to uh, in the past fairly rarely, but it's become a, a great stop for us. Uh, it is part of the National Park uh, system now. And of course, uh, uh, it was where uh, William Bly uh, came through and uh, uh, spent a little bit of time restoring his uh, faith, I think, in human nature and also uh, uh, just uh, uh, getting himself and his men together. Uh, we have uh, a, um, I guess he'd be called a squatter nowadays, but um, uh, but he's um, certainly a, a great guy, David uh, Gleeson. And uh, uh, you can see a photograph of me with David. Uh, he's certainly a, a real beachcomber. And he's written a book, uh, which is uh, uh, very special on his time on Restoration Island. He lives on Restoration Island and he has permission to do that uh, through the uh, uh, traditional owners. Uh, he has a, a, a dingo pup and uh, um, that's his company basically. And when we arrive there, of course, he's only too happy to come and chat to us. It's also a resting place for prawn trawlers and other uh, fishing trawlers who will come in for protection from the uh, sow easterly trades and also, of course, uh, prawn trawlers working mainly at night come in and uh, have some sleep time during the, uh, uh, during the day before heading out for fishing at night. Because of all the different islands uh, that we encounter as we travel along the barrier reef, um, we get a chance to see the, the different shapes. There's, there's uh, what they call continental islands, like this one here, Forbes Island. Um, which was part of the mainland uh, before the last sea level rise. Um, and now it's, it's created a, an island out of a bunch of hills. And uh, so Forbes Island is a great place for both marine and terrestrial uh, exploring, if you like. So a lot of our guests like to get into those uh, coral reefs that are just offshore in the warm shallows. Other guests like to go for a wander up the hills and around the island, the coast of the island, see all these different things. And uh, it's just a little day in paradise really when we go to Forbes. Um, our, our ship is able to anchor not far offshore. We can get in onto the beach and, uh, and do our snorkeling. And it's the sort of place where you can snorkel for hours, see uh, four or five different types of clams and all these amazing reef fish, which are normally very shy. And for some reason on the Forbes reef, um, they seem to enjoy our company. It's a great opportunity there as well for um, getting out our kayaks as well. So we include the kayaks on our expeditions um, where possible too. So this is one of those great stops where we do get to use those. So. And it's also a place where we can use a glass bottom boat from time to time. And, and that's uh, uh, also uh, very important, especially for people who uh, find it uh, difficult to get into the water. Uh, it's much uh, uh, easier to actually go for a uh, uh, glass bottom boat ride and you get to see just as much as uh, anybody else on the reef. Cape York of course is uh, uh, is an icon. It's the uh, uh, it's the tip, the northernmost uh, tip of Australia, number one. Number two, it's where the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean meet. And uh, you have this uh, uh, incredible landing that, you, uh, uh, that all the guests make. We go and we have a, um, a drink of orange juice on the, on the tip and uh, uh, people can stand by the signs. Those signs seem to change constantly. Uh, you get some magic views of the, uh, 
uh, the islands just off the tip, uh, York Island and Eberak. Uh, there's lighthouses there. And you also have uh, uh, the special places such as uh, Frangipani Beach, which is on the western side of the tip, Evans Bay on the uh, right hand side. And uh, uh, you've also got rainforest, this beautiful uh, monsoon vine thickets that you can walk through uh, given the opportunity and, and the time. It's an amazing place too for wildlife. Again, um, the Torres Strait, just north of uh, the tip there, um, is a, basically a pathway for migratory bird species, as well as oceanic migrants. Um, so Cape York, um, for people who are interested in things like birds, you see all sorts of things flying down from New Guinea, kingfishers and dollar birds and uh, all kinds of, of things. Every time we go there, we see different ones doing it, but it's a pathway for nature really. Um, and again, with the sea level rise recently that separated North Australia from New Guinea, um, this is as far north as you can go on our continent. And, uh, and so a lot of the wildlife in this area is very closely related uh, and recently related to uh, places like Papua New Guinea. Thursday Island, Island of course, is probably the centre for the uh, Torres Strait uh, Islands because this is the administration area. And so uh, people from all the different islands in Torres Strait will uh, come to Thursday Island uh, quite often for uh, medical uh, reasons, uh, but also uh, to come and uh, fly out from the, those particular areas, uh, usually using Horn Island, which is across the channel. Thursday Island has some, some great places to go and visit, including the museum, Grassy Hill, um, which is uh, uh, spectacular for looking uh, out across uh, the different islands. And uh, it has a beautiful foreshore, uh, which you uh, walk along and you have the Wangai uh, trees. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you also get a chance to, uh, uh, to watch and uh, spend time with the Torres Strait Islander uh, dancers. It has museums, uh, it's got uh, art galleries, and of course it has one of the most beautiful uh, uh, cemeteries. And those cemeteries are very, very uh, picturesque, uh, and they are beautifully uh, adorned with uh, magnificent um, headstones. Also, like the Torres Strait culture is quite different to the Aboriginal culture that's on the mainland, not very far away. So you've got two quite different cultures, and that's one of the uh, big points of our trip, is uh, once we've got our mind around how Aboriginal people lived and, and or survived and, and lived and enjoyed Cape York and mainland Australia, then we go across into the Torres Strait and see a completely different Melanesian culture that came from a different direction. Um, these people are very proud of who they are, and uh, usually we get a chance to uh, see some of their, uh, their cultural dancing and some of their artworks. And uh, so it's, it's a very uh, personal experience, really, human to human. Uh, and, and of course, Thursday Island is the capital of the Torres Strait region. So uh, we meet all sorts of interesting characters who, who live and work out of there now. And you can see by the little map there on the uh, top right that uh, the top of Cape York there um, is quite close to where the Thursday Island chain starts and goes right up through the Torres Strait Islands to mainland New Guinea, which isn't very far away. So culturally, uh, it's a very exciting zone. We visit Badu Island and uh, uh, Badu Island uh, has a reputation, uh, but when it comes down to it, the people are very, very happy to see us. Uh, it is an island that there is uh, some magnificent art. Uh, there's an art centre there and uh, uh, some wonderful lino cutting has uh, done in this particular area, along with uh, some magnificent uh, art itself. The beaches are quite special, especially on the uh, western side, and then on the eastern side, as you can see on the uh, uh, on the top right, uh, and also the bottom right, those beaches are, I guess, um, a little bit more current comes down through there, so not quite as sandy, but certainly uh, beautiful walking along the uh, uh, along the foreshores. Of course, we get the opportunity to have a look at a kai kai. Uh, this is the traditional food and the way in which they cook their, uh, their food. And of course, again, you can see the dancers. The dancers uh, are again uh, of the uh, Torres Strait Islander group and that magnificent headdress that they uh, utilize. A great place to visit. 
and uh, plenty to do on Badu. A lot of the places that we get access to while we're doing these, uh, these trips up through the islands are very difficult to get to otherwise. And, and our little landing vessels allow us to, to go into places that are quite remote and uh, unused by humans. Um, and so this is an example that you're looking at there where we can quietly uh, just step onto the shore and go and explore and, and uh, look at the plant life, the animal life, take photos that uh, you wouldn't get anywhere else. So we're very lucky in the sense that we do have access with permission from the uh, locals uh, to go and see these beautiful little remote coastal locations. And of course, uh, part and parcel of, of most of the tours up into Torres Strait is the artwork. And, and so uh, a lot of what we uh, find is that uh, they'll have uh, little art classes. You'll have, uh, um, you'll have the locals actually making raffia and showing people how to make uh, raffia, how to uh, uh, dye uh, pandanus leaves so that they can utilize those in uh, ceremony. You also have this incredible uh, dance teams that are around the place. These guys all get together, they have a festival up there and, and uh, their, their music, their, uh, uh, their singing and their dancing is, is really to watch uh, very, very carefully. And of course, when it comes down to it, uh, you have all these tiny, as Ian said, remote beaches that once again, we can only get to because of our uh, permission to come ashore, but also uh, to have the Explorer, which can land us in some of these uh, very, very small inlets. We're lucky too, to be able to mix with some of the, the local artists, as you can see there, um, and our guests uh, get a huge amount of fun in practicing some of the local art styles and they get coached by, uh, by these experts that join us, uh, local people. And uh, it's quite a, uh, an experience to be able to produce some artwork along the lines of the people um, whom we are visiting. And uh, for a lot of our guests, it's a whole new experience. And, uh, and not only that, they get something to take home with them uh, that reminds them of that particular area and that cultural group. And I also think, uh, Ian, that the, uh, that the locals really love uh, uh, teaching mm. us. I think it's, uh, it's something that um, doesn't happen probably often enough. Uh, and uh, uh, it's always nice to see the guests' interest in uh, learning from those people in Torres Strait. Most definitely. And, and a lot of guests come to see the natural features, the coastlines, the, uh, the marine organisms, and get quite a surprise when they meet the local people and then they find that this is the highlight of their trip, actually looking into another culture through the, the people's eyes themselves, being explained and told all these delicate things that you wouldn't learn any other way except personal experience. So these trips have this unique uh, human aspect to them, which uh, I find incredibly exciting. Horn Island, of course, is... Uh, uh, is um, I guess more known nowadays for the fact that it was bombed during the Second World War. Uh, it's a very, very, uh, it's a large island. It used to have mining on it at one stage. Uh, and it's quite flat when it comes down to it. But uh, during the Second World War, it was uh, very much a, uh, an air base. And uh, there's a lot of evidence of World War II uh, around the island itself. And every so often we get that chance to do a tour of uh, Horn Island with, uh, um, with Liberty uh, Sea Key uh, and uh, Vanessa Sea Key has uh, made up this magnificent museum uh, at the uh, Torres Strait uh, uh, Hotel. And uh, she has artists that have uh, uh, produced some of the incredible art, but she also has details of the Second World War and the people who fought there. Uh, and it becomes very, very much an important place for some of the old diggers to go and visit. And of course, their families. And Vanessa's husband, uh, Liberty, he's got an amazing way of telling stories. He, he's, he's passionate about uh, the Second World War uh, and his ancestors, of course, were, were involved in that. And I think Horn Island got smashed almost as badly by Japanese zeros as Darwin did. 
and uh, you can see evidence of that everywhere. And, and uh, Liberty enjoys getting our groups out there and really telling the fine details, the personal names and the, and the things that happen. So it really brings it all back to life. Pretty scary, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, uh, in terms of natural features, uh, Cape York's got a huge diversity. You've got rainforests, as Jamie mentioned a minute ago, uh, different types of rainforests, very wet ones, very uh, seasonally dry ones. Um, and then we've got all sorts of beautiful examples of plants uh, within those, those uh, ecotones, if you like. And uh, so there's a beautiful Barringtonia blossoms hanging down there on some of these big coastal trees that we see, uh, the little puffy, uh, floating seeds that are on the Cape Hock bushes, which are, are blown out by the wind and, and, and they germinate away from their, their parents. We've got the old cycads, the dinosaur plants that were on the landscape long before any of the flowering plants were here. Um, we've got things like those little red beads in the centre there. Um, they're, they're in the pea family, actually, and uh, they're quite toxic and uh, not the sort of thing you'd want in your own system, so you don't put them near your mouth. But the Aboriginal ladies make beautiful uh, decorations and jewellery out of these, uh, these little, uh, they call them crab's eye beads, um, and we get a chance to see how that happens. Wild passion fruits up there in the top right, and then we get a variety of eucalypt trees, and this is interesting because uh, along the north coast of Australia and down the east coast of Australia, there are distinct species of eucalypts, many of them, but up around Cape York, they overlap a little bit, and they, there's a bit of crossover. And then just across in New Guinea, very close to, uh, to Torres Strait, we, the same gum trees are up there, uh, close, closely related. And the six or eight species that, that uh, haven't, haven't had time to change since the last sea level rise. So the one you're looking at there is one of a cluster of species that we, uh, we see on the coastline as we're, we're traveling along. Of course, we uh, also have the uh, uh, the bird life and the uh, uh, and the lizards and and uh, um, spectacular uh, uh, animal forms invertebrates as well and you've got that uh, juvenile uh, uh, white belly seagull up there in the uh, left hand side uh, just below it you have the uh, the beautiful uh, white breasted wood swallow uh, the hermit crabs I don't know what it is about hermit crabs but the minute one starts to move you'll have a crowd of people standing around them, watching them. And of course, uh, they love having races with them. You have these magnificent coloured butterflies, especially when uh, uh, everything's out in flower. And in the Cape York, there's always something out in flower. So there's always butterflies around. You have these, uh, uh, the seabirds, of course, that we find on, uh, uh, on the reef systems on the Kays. Uh, the uh, boobies, the brown boobies, the mask boobies, and of course you get uh, common noddies and the terns that are uh, quite often breeding on those uh, kays. And then if you look carefully when you're wandering around, uh, it's nothing to see a large number of species of skink uh, and even uh, gecko, but uh, quite incredible. You've just got to keep your eyes peeled and you'll see all these uh, large and small critters. Yes, that's the, that's the beauty, um, um, as you've probably heard from um, Jamie and Ian, you know, that's the beauty of how we actually have our guest experience. So when we're on shore, we, we try and see as much of the natural ecosystem as possible. We, we want to have that real immersion with the crowds as well. So, you know, it's not uncommon that when we're actually on an expedition, we've got all these locals, like the gentleman we're talking about, that, you know, they want to come and greet you and say hello. And, you know, you've got those little cuties down the bottom, you know, waving us goodbye. Um, so it's always about not just the, the beautiful location, but the beautiful people that we meet along the way um, and that immersive learning as well that comes with it. So there's always an opportunity for, you know, a beautiful sunset to have some sunset drinks. Um, the locations where we can on the, the Torres Strait trip and um, we'll have snorkeling opportunities and um, as you heard as well, um, kayaking and um, diving as well. Um, but you, you probably heard the gentleman mention a few times uh, the explorers. So uh, wouldn't you agree, Ian and Jamie, that um, these explorers are definitely um, a highlight to making our trips as special as they are? Indeed, indeed. Very, I um, mean, great, simply because uh, 
people, uh, some people have trouble with uh, movement. And, and so uh, it's easy to walk on and uh, walk off. Uh, the platforms on the back of, of uh, Coral Discoverer uh, and uh, Coral Venturer, of course, uh, have these uh, incredible uh, platforms that are able to lift the uh, explorers out of the water. And this makes life really easy for, for guests. Who invented those, I think. And uh, it, it was developed uh, on, on our sh early vessels and, and it's got better and better. So uh, it, is, it is a sort of an in-house uh, invention that has become very, very critical to us accessing these, uh, these remote parts of the northern coastline. Absolutely. And it gives us the benefit too where, you know, sometimes you might be out on expedition for a few hours and, you know, having that closed canopy um, and also that marine toilet on board and then not to mention, we've got the, um, the guest commentary because you wouldn't want to miss anything that our, our guest lecturers or expedition team are talking about. So um, we've got that commentary on board uh, with microphones and stuff. So they definitely are a, a fantastic little um, expedition vessel that we use quite frequently on our expeditions. But not only is the, um, the experience offshore um, quite, quite amazing and relaxed, um, also on board, we always include, of course, our uh, morning teas, afternoon teas, lunches, breakfast, dinners, the works. Um, there's never a shortage of food on board, um, all chef prepared. Um, and then multiple places for, um, for you to just grab a, a beverage or um, we'll do captain's welcomes from time to time as well. Um, or you've got the option to purchase drinks outside of meal service as well. So we do include um, house beers and wines and um, some house spirits at lunch and dinner, um, but plenty of opportunity to purchase a a glass and sit up on the beautiful sun deck and um, take in all the sights. Um, if you're not wanting to do that, there's plenty of um, guest lecturer presentations or expedition leader presentations on board up in our lounge. Um, or you can go and say hello to the captain up in the bridge. Um, that's something different that we do that most people um, don't have the option on on most other um, expedition lines. Um, we allow our guests to actually go up into the bridge and you can learn about the course, um, you can chart the maps, um, yeah, or just bring the captain a coffee. <laughs> so yeah, plenty of um, activities to do on board as well. It's always a nice relaxed atmosphere. So our, um, our Coral Discoverer is the, the vessel that does our uh, Torres Strait expedition, um, as well as our Cape York and Island land. Um, and that only has the 36 staterooms on board. So really nice and spacious. Um, we've got a promenade deck, which is um, around the, the whole vessel. So plenty of options for you to walk around, um, have your own sense of space. Um, and then you've got a variety of staterooms, be it either balcony staterooms, picture windows or portal windows. Um, and then you've just got these beautiful um, open dining areas. So when they've designed the ships, um, I mean, some of the locations that we go to for um, you know, like up in the Torres Strait, you've got these beautiful views around you. Um, they've designed our dining room so that you've got full views through those windows. So you're never missing the sights. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. And then, of course, um, bridge deck lounge, multiple bars, etc. on board these vessels. Um, and then just that really relaxed, um, nice coastal, coastal feel on board. So the um, Coral Discoverer, she was refurbished um, only in 2016, so um, she's still very fresh um, and gorgeous on board. So gentlemen, I'm sure you've got plenty of top tips as well for um, everyone to make sure that they pack um, for one of their expeditions. Well, you're certainly, uh, you're, you're dressed for warm weather, uh, but uh, it's a, a great idea to make sure that you've got a jacket because uh, I can tell you in the the time uh, uh, the winds get up and uh, when they get up uh, more early morning uh, a trip in the Explorer will freeze you rather rapidly so it's a good idea to make sure that you, you have a, a good jacket some long pants uh, that you can change later on. Uh, you need to make sure you have wet landing gear because most of the areas that we uh, land while they may be sandy they're going to be wet uh, and we prefer that people wear uh, some form of footwear, just in case. Nobody knows what it's like underneath the uh, sand. So they're most important. And you make sure you bring a camera and don't ever forget your binoculars if you've got them. Uh, 
but certainly don't forget your camera. Make sure you bring all the bits and pieces that go with the camera. Uh, new uh, cards, uh, um, chargers and the like. Don't leave them at home. Absolutely. I think most importantly, you've got to pack that sense of adventure because there's always an adventure to be had on one of our trips. <laughs> And just think, remember that you don't have to do uh, uh, every uh, everything every day. If you want to have a rest, have a rest. Uh, just make sure that you uh, are prepared to uh, go for a, a challenging hike. Uh, and if it is, we'll let you know. We always let you know exactly how it, uh, it's going to be. What we do too with our cameras quite often is uh, we, we'll have half a dozen uh, of our um, Passengers who are keen as with their uh, on wildlife and cameras and things like that, uh, as well as the guest lecturers and the expedition leaders, we're all shooting away at, at um, dugongs and turtles and possums and sea eagles and whatever comes along, crocodiles. And at the end of the trip, we're able to kind of pool our resources and make sure that people who don't have cameras or aren't used to using cameras can still get a range of the images of the things that we uh, we see on our, our journey. So. Um, I, I wouldn't dare try one of these trips without a camera. I've seen too many amazing things to ever want to leave a camera behind. But uh, there is that, that option of being able to, uh, to get images later, which uh, we try to make sure everybody has access to. Absolutely. And um, one of the other the benefits that we do is that, um, you know, we do have multiple trips that are joined. So you can join uh, your Torres Strait trip with um, various expeditions, you've got your Kimberleys, your Reefs, your Cape York, so they're all sort of at various times throughout the year, but um, yeah, definitely have a look to see if there's any of those that you can join, um, because we do have a 10% saving when you do a join uh, two cruises together, so definitely keep that in mind. Um, and then on behalf of myself and um, all of the, my lovely expedition team here, um, thanks for joining us today, and feel free to tune in for our next webinar. We look forward to seeing you all. Come and join us. Lovely. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank Thanks. you.